Tonight, a rescue package to get more of us travelling again. So how many jobs will a billion dollars save? And what happens to our recovery when JobKeeper ends? You've got loads of questions. Welcome to Q&A. Welcome to the program. Joining me tonight, President of the National Farmers Federation, Fiona Simpson. Shadow Home Affairs Minister, Christina Keneally. Minister for International Development in the Pacific, Zed Seselja. Legal scholar and citizenship expert, Kim Rubenstein. And joining us from the West, Perth Breakfast Radio host, Gareth Parker, on the other side of that big border. Please make all of them feel welcome. <laughs> Uh, you can stream us live on iView and all of the socials, of course, and you can join the conversation on Instagram and Twitter. Quanda is the hashtag. Please do keep it respectful. Let's go straight to far north Queensland tonight, where tourism has been hit particularly hard, of course. We're joined by two tourism operators, Alan Wallish and Andrea Cameron, who are standing by in Cairns tonight. Guys, thanks so much for joining us on the program. Big announcement today from the federal government uh, for your sector. I know that you're happy with some of the news, but... You've really been impacted pretty heavily by the loss of the international market. Uh, Andrea, how's your business coping? How much have you lost? How many staff have you had to let go? Oh, look, my uh, business, obviously, like everyone else's, has been um, um, absolutely decimated. Um, normally, I'd be running 42 tours a week. Um, now I'm down to six a week if I'm lucky. Um, I've only got one staff member left. I've had to let everyone else go. Um, so although today's announcement has been encouraging, it's, it's still not going to be enough. And Alan, I think you've currently got 18 staff on JobKeeper. You had 34 staff pre-COVID. What happens to those 18 staff that are on JobKeeper when it ends? As things stand, can you keep them going? Uh, well, we will. I mean, I need those 18 staff to actually run the business. They're, they're my key staff. Who with me now for... Some of them have been with me for 15 years, so I'm not letting them go anywhere. Um, but, uh, yeah, obviously, uh, the end of JobKeeper is, is certainly a financial hit. Um, and we're, we're hoping that um, there's the announcement today with the vouchers, people wanting to come up to Cairns so that we can look after you, show you a great holiday. Um, and the, the interest-free loans... Uh, will just, just help us get through uh, a few more months uh, while, while things start to sort themselves out, I guess. So I'm just interested in that line about a few more months. Obviously, there's some forecast that it could be a year, more than that, before we see the international market come back. Can you see a way through to the other side of this currently, notwithstanding the announcements today? Yeah, I look, th this is the thing that everybody needs to realise. So we're probably 12, 18 months, 24 months away from from getting any sizeable international tourism uh, anywhere in Australia and particularly up here where tourism was really 70% of our market. Um, when people plan holidays overseas, they don't just travel the following Monday. You know, they put six months into it, 12 months, etc. So we really need a strong Australian market to get behind travelling in Australia, particularly coming to areas like here, uh, Cairns, where we can show you a fantastic holiday. Uh, and, and support our small operators so that we can um, uh, get through this, uh, this, this really amazing time that we find ourselves in. So, Alan, what's your question for the panel tonight, for the government particularly? Uh, my, my question to the panel would be, we've, we've, we were reaching a cliff at the end of March. Um, we're re pretty much there now. Um, these incentives are certainly helpful, but we're going to hit another cliff come September. So um, do we have some concrete plans as we go forward until the international market uh, uh, can find its way back into Australia? Is it? Uh, well, thank you uh, very much, Alan and, and Andrea, for, um, for the question. And, and um, I had the uh, great opportunity to visit Cairns just uh, a week or so ago and, and met with a number of the businesses uh, there. And, and it's, it's fair to say we understand, and I know Dan Tian and uh, the Treasurer and others have been... Uh, 
going uh, to, to places like Cairns and hearing from businesses who are doing it tough. And um, one of the things, I guess, as we've been grappling uh, with the great challenge of uh, the COVID crisis, uh, both the health crisis and then the economic crisis has been, we've always sought to uh, have uh, very, very strong uh, levels of support, uh, targeted support, and obviously you're aware of uh, things like JobKeeper and JobSeeker and a, and a range of supports for small business cash flow that have been in the economy and have seen large chunks of the economy uh, starting to really come back. Uh, and there's been some really, really positive signs in the last few months, but we're very aware uh, of the great challenges that are in some of our particular regions, and Cairns, of course, is one of those regions that does rely on international tourism, that even when we look at domestic tourism, of course, is a flying destination. And that was one of the strong messages I got uh, when I was in Cairns. So just, just to be clear, though, given all the fanfare today, mm. the, the ministers standing in front of aeroplanes, all the noise, you understand that for these businesses, this is not certainty. I mean, if they're down to 20% of their operating capacity currently, these cheap flights and some of the loans, it's not necessarily going to see them through, is it? Well, there's, let me go through the measures because I think that there's a lot in this and one of the very strong messages we were receiving, not just in Cairns, but in other uh, tourism dependent areas uh, was the need to get people flying to those areas again because when you get them on those planes, uh, when you and let's face it, uh, if you're going to go to Alice or you're going to go to Broome or you're going to go to Cairns and, and such places, most people are going to need to fly in order to get there. So by halving uh, the cost of getting there, uh, we will provide a lot of impetus for Australians to be travelling. Remember, these have suffered because... So, so you, th you do think it's enough? Well, I, I'm not, I'm not going to say it's enough. I'll, I'm going to say that it is a very substantial package, along with the support for the aviation industry, along with the extension of the small and medium enterprise loan scheme, and all of the other supports we've been putting into the economy. And what we've said all the way through, Hamish, is that we, and, and I think we've had a good record of this, we will do what is needed and we will adjust to circumstances as they go forward. Uh, so I think we will see a lot of Australians taking advantage of this. There are a lot of other let, factors let that will go... Nick there in. are a lot of other factors that will go to the success of it because uh, people need to have that confidence. So uh, as we see vaccine rollouts... Sure, we, we are going to get to that, sure, Christina. But, 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 but that the borders won't close is another important factor <laughs> as well. Look, um, Hamish, let's be clear. Uh, we welcome any support, uh, but what was announced today... Uh, is too little and it's too late. You know, for tourism operators like Andrea and Alan, uh, they've been suffering for months and JobKeeper has been sustaining them. And I hope people do take up the cheap flights. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, it's unevenly distributed. You know, it's lucky if you're in one of the locations that gets the cheap flights. What if you're a tourism operator in an area that doesn't? What if you're one of the one million Australians who's currently on JobKeeper? Come the end of March... These one million of our fellow Australians are going to be left behind by the Morrison government. And, and I think the other aspect is, um, what is the impact in terms of all of Australia? What is the benefit to all Australians? And how much is the government sharing with us who is actually going to benefit? Mm. Um, perhaps there are lots of um, women who have shared the disproportionate load of childcare who need a holiday and would like to take that up because of the extra effort that they've had during um, COVID. But there's also a reference to Australians taking this up. The 30,000 Australians overseas who are not able to even get into the country are not going to be able to take this up. Mm. Gareth Parker, you're in Western Australia. I think there's one location amongst those uh, included in these cheap flights by the federal government. And for many Australians, getting to WA just isn't really even possible currently. How do you look at it from where you sit? Well, the one location you speak of is Broome in the Kimberley, and it's a beautiful place, but at the moment it's sort of full because West Australians uh, are holidaying there because they can't go overseas, and I don't think that there's the confidence to travel outside of the state because you're never quite sure when a border might be closed or when the rules might be changed and forcing them into quarantine. So I think that's actually the biggest issue. Like, Australians want to go on a holiday. I'm convinced about that. I would love to go on a holiday. <laughs> I haven't got on a plane since uh, November 2019, and it's hard to see when the next time I will because of that confidence issue. Um, so we need to get some national consistency around when a border will be closed, when quarantine rules will be changed. And I know that the hard border's been super popular here in WA, but I think the time to move beyond that is pretty much arrived. Uh, and, and, and for the tourism operators, right, they are affected in really different ways. If you're running accommodation in Western Australia in the southwest, two hours drive from Perth, you're really, really busy because you've got a captive market. 
But if you're running a tour like uh, Andrea is, then you're really reliant on people coming from overseas because locals don't tend to go on to tours. So the impacts are really different depending on the type of tourism business that you operate. And so, what so you the, really that need point, Gareth, is I the just, movement of people to come back. I, I, I want to bring in our next question. It's a video question, in fact, from one of the exact kind of locations that you're talking about. This comes from Anthea Hammond. The support package announced today acknowledges the importance of the tourism industry, but it excludes most tourism destinations and does nothing to support operators that rely heavily on international tourism. My question is, how do you expect businesses to survive and what is being done to make sure that there are still attractions and experiences for international visitors to come back to on the other side of the pandemic? Fiona Simpson, I mean, 13 locations obviously targeted by these flights. There are other packages for other parts of the country. But does it seem to you like it's a bit uneven? I think it's really hard, isn't it? So JobKeeper has obviously been the package that has kept Australia going. It's kept people in jobs. And now, as we're seeing people actually start to recover, we're seeing jobs starting to be advertised in the regions. There's lots of jobs being advertised at the moment. And the economy is probably recovering a little bit better than everybody thought it would. I mean, farmers are absolutely no strangers to going without income and, mm -hmm. and going without income for a long time, for that matter. So I think the challenge is, how does the government keep delivering support and assistance to those that need it in a fair way where it's going to keep businesses going. And when I look at some of the areas in regional New South Wales, uh, in actual fact, some of those are going gangbusters uh, because people are driving, they're taking mm. driving holidays now. Mm. And so it's, it's really hard to comment on a package that... You know, I, I'm not a tourism operator. I think it, it is a bit hard to see winners and losers. But by the same token, you have to keep... The government has to keep... They can't just keep putting out blanket things. Mm -hmm. They need to target who needs the support and deliver that support in a way that's really going to be best bang for buck. Because someone's got to pay for it, Hamish. At the end of the day, the next generation's going to have to pay for it mm -hmm. somehow. Mm -hmm. Zed, the, the bulk of the winners, though, in this package on the flights are in Queensland. And the point's been made... Uh, by New South Wales today and some other jurisdictions that Queensland's being rewarded for keeping its borders shut for most of the last year. Well, I, I wouldn't accept that, Hamish. And, and one of the reasons Queensland uh, features in this is because of the unique nature of how spread out Queensland is with large population centres and these tourist destinations that but are it, along... But wouldn't but, its but, tourism but, sector but, be in a better but, place if its borders had been open? Well, with, without a doubt, yeah. uh, without a doubt. But, um, but that doesn't go to... It, it doesn't go to rewarding, uh, you know, the Queensland State Government for closing borders. But it does recognise that uh, people aren't just going to get in the car from Melbourne and go to Cairns, uh, or even from Brisbane in many cases so why, and go to why, Cairns. So why can't um, people in Brisbane get these subsidised flights Well, if, flights I, if I could Cairns. just finish, Christina, because um, what we are targeting is... The, and we talk about those areas closer to Sydney, those areas closer to Melbourne where people can drive, uh, many of those are reporting very, very strong tourism activity. But, uh, you know, Christina was saying, you know, too little, too late. We've, we've heard this from the Labor Party right throughout. Uh, when we announced, for instance, our, our homemaker plan, they said it wouldn't do anything. And we are seeing now a housing market and the fears from, from some... Home builder, sorry. Um, so, well, in either case, it's doing the job. And you said it wouldn't do the job. You said it was too little, it was too late, it wouldn't but, create any jobs. Said, Yet we're seeing thousands respect, of jobs in the, the building Labor Party. Industry. This is not the Labor Party saying it's too little, too late. But your criticism is the too, same every time. It is, it is too two, little, too late, no matter what we put on the table. Peak, it is the two peak tourism bodies in this country who came out today and said this announcement was too little, too late and would not do enough to save jobs. Yet we... So why are Queenslanders... <laughs> Why are Brisbane residents being punished by the Morrison government not able to take up these subsidised flights to go to Cairns? Yeah. I don't understand that. This is the unequal distribution. And, and I might just say, can I say, Hamish, I want to thank you for hosting the show in Melbourne because you got me on a plane for the first time <laughs> uh, in, to come to Melbourne in over a year. So you're, you're stimulating some tourism here yourself. <laughs> I was really excited to come to Melbourne, the home city of the tourism minister, Dan Tian. I was really hoping 
hoping he would be here to talk to this announcement tonight. I would have thought if he was really that proud of it, he would have turned up here on national television and promoted it to the nation. And I have to wonder, did he not brief these tourism bodies yesterday and find out how diabolical their reaction was and decide he wouldn't be here tonight? We're very grateful to have Zed Seselja here. I should make that point very clear. I want to bring in two people in our audience who are uh, around the tourism sector, Lisa Mann and Ashley Causeman. You run a company called Corjo. Uh, many people will have used your products. What, what do you make? What do you do? We import and wholesale travel accessories, so things that people take mostly when they go overseas. So adapter, plugs, money belts, neck pillows, those kind of things. And how much is your turnover down by at the moment? We're down over 90%. OK. And so you've kept some staff on yep. because of JobKeeper, is that right? That's right. Yep. And because so we love our staff. Obviously you love your staff. What happens to them once JobKeeper ends? Um, some more will have to go, unfortunately. There are some key staff that we will keep on, but they're working significantly reduced hours and we really worry for them how they're going to be able to continue to support their families. So are you wondering why you're not included in measures for the, for the sector that you're part of? Sure. And it's not really just about us. There's a, a huge swathe of industry that's international travel dependent. So think about airport retail stores, duty frees, luggage stores, um, luggage and travel accessory companies like us. Um, without international travel, there's really no business. Gareth Parker, do you think it's too soon then to be ending JobKeeper? Well, what I think is that the key to helping um, businesses like Corjo, and you make excellent, or you import excellent <laughs> Nick pillows, thank you, I think I've got three of them, um, <laughs> but the, the key is to get people moving again, isn't it? We need to get people yep. through the airports. That's actually the key to rebuilding the business. Now, the government's had a role, an unprecedented role, really, in trying to support the incomes of businesses who, through absolutely no fault of their own, have been wrecked by this pandemic. But the solution, I think, is not endless government subsidy, it's try and get people moving again. And this is where I think that the vaccine is so important and I think that we need to change our thinking about what constitutes success. Um, and, and easy to say when it's not my job on the line uh, and I feel enormous sympathy for, for you guys uh, in trying to make these heartbreaking decisions to let go of, of loyal employees. Mm. Um, but the, the key to getting it all going again is getting people moving again and that's how you rebuild the business. And a risk-based approach, Hamish, to how we lock down. You know, we, yeah. we may well see, uh, again, lockdowns. I hope not. We're going through, you know, it feels too good to be true at the moment. But we can't just keep shutting whole states down if there's an outbreak somewhere. But hang on, I mean, Gareth Parker's virtually in a different country. He's in he Western is. Australia. He's, I think I'm allowed to talk to him, but it's just as well he's virtual. <laughs> are, they, are they ever going to open that border again? Yeah, of course. I mean, look, let, let's be real. It, it's, it's open right now um, to uh, every state except for Victoria, where it's open, but there's a requirement <laughs> that you've got to quarantine for 14 days until I think it's changing on the 15th of March. So what's but that? But we're all it's here two in days after the state election. <laughs> no, I get it. Trust me, I get it. I, uh, I, I think, look, it, it, it was really important 12 and 10 and 9 months ago uh, when we didn't know what we were dealing with. I personally, and this is not a popular view in my home state, but I think that the border arrangements have gone on for too long mm. and I don't think that... I think they're too risk-averse. And, look, the Premier, to his credit, is going to win an amazing election victory on Saturday... Uh, and he, he says himself that he's taking an extremely cautious approach. For mine, it's too cautious and there are consequences if you do want to travel or if you do need to travel. Uh, if you don't need to travel and your whole life's here in WA, <laughs> then you're very thankful that the virus isn't here and life goes on almost completely unaffected. Kim Rubenstein, the truth is it's been incredibly popular in places like Western Australia. To, to it has indeed. Up. It really does take us back to the turn of the century with protectionism running really strong in terms of the different colonies of the time and what the struggles were at the framing mm -hmm. of the Constitution. But there was a very clear sense that we were creating a national... Commonwealth and there would be a recognition that each sovereign state would still have its own capacity to protect specific interests to the state but not in a way that was discriminatory or protectionist and this is the fine line that it would be very hard I think for, a, for any Premier now with the changed health conditions to maintain that they were doing it proportionally to the health needs of their community. But Mark McGowan in WA who looks like he's going to be a swept to victory at this weekend's election again is saying that he would like to keep border controls in place longer term to keep methamphetamines out of the state. Is that... Well, the High Court up. has more power over that than the people of Western Australia in terms of re-electing, so that if he sought <laughs> to continue to do that, there would be 
without doubt challenges to the lawfulness of that, constitutionally speaking. Uh, and just on that point, he sort of walked it back almost within hours because he got a backlash here in WA. Uh, and they're now talking about expanded police search powers at the road borders, which is a pretty different um, position to saying, oh, we're going to keep hard borders to keep meth out indefinitely. So I think even he realised he'd gone too far and, and, Hamish, it's not just the people, it's the goods too. You know, when we had trouble getting people's food on the shelves and the big toilet paper um, lack, of, lack of supply, it was because we couldn't get the things across the borders, because everything was shutting down. And while we have that, it's not that we don't produce enough stuff here in Australia, mm. we produce heaps. But when you're stopping people, when you're stopping goods moving across the borders, then it creates a huge amount of issues for people. people People like, like Corjo. Um, so that's what we have to focus on. We have to focus on let's going forward in this new paradigm now. How can we do it? How can we be sensible? How can we, how can we be risk based? But how can we actually keep Australia moving? Keep make, letting people make their monies and keep people in jobs. Z Zed, can the federal government force this issue? In terms of state borders? Yeah. Uh, no. Um, but we we have. Well, you said this. you tried and then you gave up. <laughs> well, well, I mean, what do you mean? But, no, you well, can't. Sorry. Have you read the constitution? So, sorry, we're a federation. Sorry. So your your view on the WA hard border would have been that the, the Commonwealth could have just passed a piece of ledge and and and, and my that would have view been my view is that at the very beginning of all or, or when of Victoria this, had its border closed, or when New South uh, Wales or Tasmania or South Australia. The Commonwealth Government absented themselves from this conversation. They abandoned the state borders. Right. You would have they had, had us, right. Christine, us. You would have had us override the states on. on, Chris, on Christine, have you that's read the Constitution? We are not. We are not you were never states. calling for that. We so this is now a new country. position from the Labor Party. No, in party. fact, we it, have so, been consistent. So you would have had us override. WA, we Victoria, saying, other states and territories. No, we you should have been part now. of the conversation we and part, part of the conversation. No, you weren't. Christina, we can weren't. I give you, you the WA cabinet. perspective here? Let's just Sorry, Gareth, Gareth Parker Gareth in. Wanted to make a I, would, point. I would love to give you the WA perspective on this, Christina, because the federal government were part of the debate and they got their heads absolutely shot off by the citizens of Western Australia <laughs> and so they took a political calculation and they thought, Barley's, we're not going to win this one, we're going to withdraw yeah. uh, and because the politics are too difficult for us and it's the same thing that happened in Queensland. And we have, yep. the, we have the gift of a constitutional so, expert here. Kim. Yes, so it's politics versus the constitutionality of this because the federal government has a constitutional right to intervene yes. in any matter that deals with exactly a constitutional right. issue. So in the Clive Palmer case, they could have been a participant. They started being a participant and withdrew because of a political calculation mm. rather than a constitutional calculation that it was not in their political interest, or that's what it appears to be. But um, at, constitutionally speaking, the Commonwealth has the capacity to intervene on any constitutional question. So, so what does that look like? But, but it's not up to us to, to make that. the ruling of the High Court on, no, on the Constitution. But it is up to you so, to so, show so, leadership. So, but, but, I, I don't believe that John Howard should have or Malcolm the Turnbull... Or, you ought to have the power to do that? I think you should have been part of the conversation, we part showing, of the conversation. no, you weren't. We the Prime Minister were, absented you, himself. He threw up his hands and it's all too hard. He has, oh. he, has, he has led this the country The National through. Cabinet. He has led this Give country. Me a break. I know Anthony Albanese doesn't like it because he wasn't part of it. And no, that's why no, I wasn't we don't like cabinet. it because it's uh, literally the pr premiers came together, told the Prime Minister what they were going to do, and then he went let's, out and let's announced take a step, it. Yes. That is National Cabinet. Let's take cabinet. a step back for just one moment, if we could. We can look at all of the issues that we're grappling with right now, but take a step back and look right around the world and, and think, where would you rather be during this last 12 or 18 months New South uh, than Wales. in Australia? Where no, would you I rather have been than Australia? Would you rather be in Europe? Would you rather be in the United States or Canada? Virtually nowhere in the world has gotten through this as well as we have. We must have made some good decisions. We must have had some good leadership. Yes, we have worked with Gladys, the states and territories. Dan, and our economy uh, is recovering very Anastasia, strongly. We've Mark. saved a hell of a lot of lives. Uh, and I think, you know, talking down every decision, I just don't think stacks up. All right, let's take our next question. It comes from Lev Chikaski. Australia has performed remarkably well relative to almost all other industrialised nations through the pandemic-induced economic crisis. With business conditions now returning to normal levels, at what point should governments allow businesses to fa sorry, should, at what point should governments allow businesses to fail and succumb to market forces? Okay. So, mm. Gareth Parker. Good question. Really good question, really tough question, and that's, I suspect, what Zed and all of his colleagues are grappling with, and that's mm. what part of this tourism announcement is about today, to say, look, if you think that you can make a go of your business, 
then we'll back you by providing a loan, but we don't just want to continue on with sort of indefinite subsidies. And I think that that's the position for the economy more generally. Look, take away the pandemic um, and, and pretend that it's ordinary times. Uh, for the most part, we accept that in our system that businesses rise and businesses fall. No one's got a right to make a, a success of it as a business and conditions change, the world's dynamic and so the winners are the ones who adapt to the changing world. Now, this is no one's fault, which is why it's a little bit different. And the, the, the difference is that we have interrupted the ordinary course of things. Government's done it, you know, they've stopped people travelling and, and that's why we're in such a good position. You know, people can't come and go from Australia. C clearly, the biggest decision to get us through coronavirus the most important was closing the international borders really early. That was the most important factor in getting us where we are now. But it's had consequences. So, look, I'm, I'll say this. I don't know the answer to your question. I'm very glad I'm not the one making, responsible for making the decision. So, a lot of people in Melbourne have been impacted by all of this, particularly, perhaps more so than other parts of the country. Just want to see a show of hands. Who has received JobKeeper? Who's in a household where JobKeeper has or, or is being received? Let's just take a look. Because that's a pretty sizeable chunk of our studio audience. Christina Keneally, mm. would Labor let JobKeeper run indefinitely? Uh, well, we have always said that uh, JobKeeper isn't a permanent fixture, mm. but, of course, it needs to be tailored to the economic conditions. Sure, but it, it costs and a lot. So how sure. long would you keep it running for? Well, I think, Hamish, you've got to look at the fact that uh, right now we've got the OECD and the Reserve Bank saying this is not the time to withdraw support from the economy. You know, we've got, on the one hand, you know, the, the Liberal government going around saying mission accomplished, we're on where the recovery has begun. The reality is for the 2 million Australians who are either... Um, out of work who can't get enough hours to pay their bills, for the, uh, for the 1 million Australians, 10% of the workforce that are still on JobKeeper, it doesn't feel like a recovery. It still feels like sure, a recession. I, I get it. There's no question about the need. I'm just interested yep. what Labor would do if it won office, because there could be an election this year. Mm, there could be. Would you, would you keep JobKeeper going? Do you know when it's going to be, Zed? No, OK. That, um, anyway. Uh, nice <laughs> attempt at a deflection. Would you keep JobKeeper running beyond what the government is currently planning? We've for? been quite clear that uh, we would not have JobKeeper end, uh, a hard end at the end of the month. We would have preferred to see it continue in a targeted way towards those industries and those areas of the country where it is still needed. And would you, and put, our a frustration... timeline, would you put a timeline on it? Well, though? Hamish, um, the timeline has to be guided by the economic conditions. You, 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 I don't think anyone could have predicted a year ago where we would be today. And I think anyone who says, economically speaking, where we're going to be in a year's time is necessarily speaking with great confidence. The th there, are, there are a couple of things that are going to affect how we this economic recovery for tourism and everyone else goes effectively. And one is the rollout of the vaccine. Sure. We heard today in the Senate COVID committee that the government cannot hold to the commitment to have us all vaccinated by October. They said it is impossible to say when we'll all be vaccinated. If you want to ask me what is the one thing that's going to give Australians confidence to get up and travel outside their home state, that's going to give businesses confidence, that they're going to have a a trajectory towards economic recovery, it's the confidence that we are going to have that vaccine rolled out. Fiona, it goes to the question, though, about whether it's time to start wrapping it up. It's costly, isn't it? Doesn't it's, it have to end at some point? It's really costly. And, I mean, it, it is how long's a piece of string. I mean, I'm with Gareth. I don't know who makes these decisions. How do you make them? But what I know is when we have droughts in regional Australia, we have year on year on year with no income. And it's not just the farmers. It's the small rural and regional businesses as well. They have to let people go. They have to make hard decisions. And, you know... The, the sort of targeted... Pull, pull the drawbridge up. No, it. no, I don't think you can pull the drawbridge up. But what I think we're seeing government do now is they're really assessing... I mean, it's very hard to say when the right time is. And this is an unprecedented... I, I don't know when the right time is either. Businesses fail. Um, businesses in rural and regional areas have failed over the last five years massively because of the drought. Because, and they've had to let all their employees mm. go. Businesses that have been generational. Um, you know, towns have been decimated. Um, so... It is about hard questions and hard decisions and collecting the data and making sure that, that we can actually deliver that, that support to businesses that, that can recover in some way. And, it, and it's being delivered in a way that's going to help them keep generating income and supporting the jobs. And so that's not an easy thing. I think that's really hard. JobKeeper, I think, was really appropriate. It was a blanket, um, a blanket measure that went across the, the community, pretty much. Kept people in jobs at the toughest time. It kept dollars turning around our communities, our rural and regional communities, as well as cities like Melbourne. Um, so 
At some point, though, that you've got to acknowledge that there are the economy is is starting to recover. There are green shoots. There are things happening, mm. and so the government has to ease off. Now, you're never going to be want to be the one where the government is easing off from. Uh, obviously, people still want to be helped. Um, so the challenge, though, and I don't think there's an easy answer to your question. But at the end of the day, you know, we have to have targeted measures in place. The government, the government of the government, it'll, the people will speak at the polls. If they don't like what they're doing, then they might you know, want to give Labor a go next time. But somebody has to make the decisions. They have to back it up with the data. They have to be very clear about what they're doing. Mm -hmm. um, and there will be people who win and there will be people who don't. Well, the point was made that it is about the vaccine rollout. And we do have a question on that. It's from Carol Kiernan. We in Victoria heard lots of criticism of our state government over COVID hotel quarantine. However, there's been scant disapproval from the media over the many missteps from the federal government causing the late arrival of the COVID vaccine. Many countries are well ahead of us and we're now facing winter. My local Melbourne doctor is still waiting on supplies. Why not the same outrage about this disorganised response? Kim Rubenstein. Look, I think there's a, a general sense that we need some leadership here in terms of consistency of approach to looking after the entire community. I mean, the, um, the quarantine framework is another aspect of this that hasn't been brought in. But in terms of the actual vaccination, that together with in, um, an enlarged quarantine framework would be opening up the economy even more. My, my last thought in relation to our discussion about, you know, where does this fit in the economy, the economy is linked into the health issues. And ultimately, we want the leadership to be coordinating the health issues with the economy, because then the economists surely can predict and say, mm we need this stimulus for a certain number more of more months before we return to a, a more normal post-COVID reality. So they're all interlinked, in my view. Uh, Gareth, is the federal government over-promising and under-delivering already on the, on the vaccine rollout, do you think? The, well, the numbers say obviously yes, but it's very, very early days. Um, I, and I think the que to, to, the, to the question... Uh, the reason there's not more outrage is because at the moment people aren't sick. We're in a fortunate position, no one's sick, no one's dying. So among ordinary people, I don't think there's this sort of clamour for the vaccine in a way there would have been if we had a pandemic raging. Um, but I do think it needs to happen and I think we are, um, you know, thank goodness we've got some manufacturing capacity locally because we've already seen a bit of this uh, attempts from Europe to, to block the export of the vaccine to Australia and I sort of understand why because they've got a much bigger urgent problem right now than we do. Um, that said, if we want to get people moving again, and I think this is the hardest decision for the federal government, is how do they decide when and how to reopen the border? And, and to Kim's point just then, I actually think if you want to boost national productivity, you could do a lot worse than a massive investment in hotel quarantine nationally to allow many, many more, not just Australians come home, but other people to come here who've tested negative to COVID overseas. So we've got some confidence to get people coming and going again. So I think that's actually what you can do. Just on the vaccine rollout, I think the federal government could do well to spend a lot more time talking to the state health departments who are used to rolling out services. Yeah. Uh, and I think that will be the key, not just through the GPs, they're important, but get it through the state health departments and the hospitals as well. But it's not only the state. It's also the federal government. It has responsibility over quarantine. It has capacity over the territories. There are businesses out there that are calling to say they would work with government in setting up new quarantine facilities like Howard Springs in the Northern Territory. And if we're living in a world where the, the pandemic might erupt again, that is a real investment for the continued um, globalisation po positivity that we can get from travel. Zed, the truth is the, the rollout is slipping, isn't it? It is behind schedule. We're not getting the vaccines as promised. Well, the first thing I would say is uh, it is early days. We have well over a million uh, doses now in the country and very soon uh, we will be having our own manufacturing okay, come on, let's capacity. be honest here. Well, You're behind no, schedule. But, well, you said look, 4 you million behind? people will be vaccinated if I could by just, the end of March. If, if I could will just, that happen? Well, if I could just finish. Uh, we've got over a million doses uh, in the country already. Uh, we're about to ramp up our own capacity. Uh, and we, did, uh, we didn't go down the path of emergency approvals for various reasons, one of which is because we've had better control of the pandemic than many other countries. Uh, but as we get uh, that, that national sovereign capability rolling out, uh, which will be happening very soon, uh, you will see very, very quickly it ramp up. So uh, 
you know, is it always perfect? No. Are there always, are there always Does challenges? Does getting, getting back on track? I mean, we used well, to well, go, get back to those original schedules of having most adults done by October. Well, that is, that is our intent. Uh, that is our intent. And if you look at the capacity that will be coming through CSL uh, to ramp up uh, millions and millions of doses, uh, that is our expectation. That is our intent. There are always challenges uh, in rolling these things out early. We've talked about uh, some of the challenges in, in some of the export restrictions that were imposed in Europe. But we've, we've, we haven't put all our eggs in one basket. We can manufacture. We're procuring from various sources. Uh, and I think what you'll see over the next few weeks is, is that it'll start to roll out far more quickly. OK. Hey, Michelle, I have to respond to that. I am sorry. Very briefly, please. Very Senator. briefly. Prime Minister said we'd be at the front of the queue. We're not. 74 countries were ahead of us. Prime Minister said 400 of us would be vaccinated... 4 million of us would be vaccinated by the end of the March. We've only got 3.9 million to go before the end of okay. March. That sounds uh, like some talking well, points I've heard but before. No, no, so but let's but move on. Let's get to some oh, other issues on. dominating today, the national today conversation. Today they confirmed... Senator Keneally, if I could just ask Today you to pause they there, they we're going to move on. we would not hit the October deadline. Okay. Don't let him get away with that. <laughs> Let's move on to some other really important questions dominating the national conversation this week. And our next question comes from Chloe Hunt. I am a 22-year-old law student. I am a survivor of sexual assault and am studying law as I hope to build a career helping victims of sexual violence receive justice. In the last few weeks, the government has alienated many women like myself. So my question is for Kim Rubenstein. The Prime Minister has dismissed the possibility of an independent inquiry into the historical rape allegation against Christian Porter, saying it would be inconsistent with the rule of law. Most sexual assaults go unreported. Only one in 10 of those reported lead to a conviction. Is it fair to dismiss an inquiry when the rule of law fails victims of assault and rarely brings perpetrators to justice? Well, thank you, Chloe, for asking the question and sharing your experience. I hope you will be joining thousands upon thousands of people on Monday the 15th of March for the Women's um, March for Justice around the country to raise these really significant issues to ensure that our leaders really listen to the voices of women throughout the country and men who are supporting equality broadly. <laughs> but significantly on the importance of an independent inquiry, I am very clear that it is fundamental to our system of representative democracy that a minister who has been subject to, to serious allegations be stood aside while there is some assessment as to his being fit and proper for the role as a minister. Mm. This is quite separate to the criminal responsibility. You will have learnt in your constitutional law classes, I hope, that we have a system where we have a legislature, an executive and the judiciary. Each of those institutions are key for safeguarding the rule of law. And the rule of law is not just a question of the laws that govern us, because any country, Nazi Germany had a rule of law, but a rule of law in a democracy is about accountability between elections, but it's also about keeping the executive accountable in between elections. And every member of parliament is accountable to their own constituency. And so each um, uh, voter, each active citizen, will decide whether they want Christian Porter to be back as their representative. But that's a separate question to whether he should be the highest in the highest legal role in the country as so, Attorney so I just, General. So I just want to push you on this a little bit. And I want to make clear it's a single allegation, not multiple. Yes. Um, what sort of inquiry do you think would be appropriate? Yes. So within our parliamentary framework and within the notion of the executive, there is a capacity to have an inquiry in relation to the testing out of some of those allegations in relation to whether there is a sufficient um, amount of material that would raise questions as to whether he should continue in the most senior legal role in the land. He is responsible for law reform. He is responsible for initiating um, and, resp and representing the government in any legal matter, domestically and internationally. So that person, as Attorney General, it's actually not about Christian Porter, about the role of Attorney General has to be beyond re uh, repute. And there are many instances where ministers have been stood down for a range of different reasons. But the answer to your what type of inquiry, someone who is a senior investigator or eminent former judge, in confidence would be able to call out to the community to bring information that may not have come out yet because 
as we know, the attorney himself had not even looked at those allegations. I mean, there are serious questions of judgment here as to the Prime Minister and the attorney not even briefing themselves properly to respond and to be aware of the allegations in full. Well, so there I want, are various I want to questions. Give that Well, firstly, uh, to Chloe, thank you for um, bringing it forward, this question, and, and for your bravery in doing so. Uh, it is a very important question. And I think the first thing I would say, and it goes to your point about um, access to justice for victims of sexual assault, that um, historically, uh, and even today, we haven't always done anywhere near as well as we should uh, by victims. And I think we should acknowledge that as a nation. I think there has been a bit of a reckoning in recent years. Uh, but and there's been efforts uh, by, whether it's by the police, whether it's by legislatures to try and grapple with these issues to improve uh, how uh, victims of sexual assault are treated, uh, how they can have their day in court and how they can seek justice. And I think that is an ongoing project uh, that we as a nation need to continue uh, to work on. When it comes to questions uh, that Kim has touched on around uh, I guess, a different process separate from the criminal justice system for the Attorney-General uh, in this case. Uh, the concerns that the government has, the concerns that I would have, uh, is that in setting up such a parallel process in these circumstances, and, and in these circumstances, and Arthur Moses, the former head of the Law Council, uh, put a very strong view uh, recently in terms of the challenges uh, with this kind of alternate process when we have a historical uh, claim. Uh, we have uh, no uh, sworn uh, victim statement. Uh, we have no witnesses uh, and we have uh, no physical evidence. Uh, in those circumstances, the question, and I don't think Kim has answered this question, I don't think the Labor Party and also calling for this type of inquiry have answered is what is the question that such an inquiry would be asking uh, when the police have examined it and, and came to come to those conclusions? Uh, what would be the burden of proof, with whom would it rest, what would be the standard of proof uh, in those circumstances. And so when Arthur Moses says it would create a shifting sands approach, that would be my concern. I absolutely accept uh, your concerns about uh, victims of sexual assault uh, getting justice through our court system, and I think there is a long way to go. But I, I, I would argue that we shouldn't look to address that serious injustice uh, that is still with us by potentially creating another serious injustice. And that's what we're grappling with, and that's one of the reasons uh, I wouldn't support such an inquiry. So I think the distinction is that the standard of proof is about ministerial responsibility. Now, the former Prime Minister, John Howard, set up in um, his first year as Prime Minister new ethical standards that would be governing ministers to recognise that ministerial responsibility is significant for the trust, the consent between the people who are, are, are in power and those they but, are But this government. allegation predates Christian Porter's time in politics by some three decades. But it does speak to his standing to maintain the trust of the people in his role as Attorney General, as the head law officer. Fiona Simpson. Do you, know what, do you know what worries me, Hamish, I think? And, and Chloe, thank you very much for standing up and thank you very much for your story and, and for asking the question. And I also want to, to acknowledge Brittany Higgins, Grace Tame, Kate, mm. who we've been talking about now for weeks. Uh, a week? More than a week. Mm. Um, it does worry me that we're focusing... We have, we, we've, I think we've spent the last week you know, discussing all these ins and outs of the Constitution and can we and can't we and should we and shouldn't we. Mm. And we can have a really good discussion here on the panel about should we, shouldn't we. I haven't seen the allegations. I don't know the Constitution. Kim has, she does. But isn't it about, you know, Zed just said then, we need to actually, you know, fix and acknowledge as a country that the legal system is failing people who have, have had sexual, sexual violence or sexual mm. assault. We know that that's hundreds of thousands sure, of women. Sure, but when politicians do talk about that, people, including the Prime Minister, say we've got to start believing victims. Mm. Now, in this instance, the Prime Minister didn't read the document containing the allegations mm. and then declared that there was no case for further interrogation. Well, but, Hamish, we have to get to the nub of the problem. The problem is here that we have a parliament that is not an exemplar workplace. It should be... I mean, I absolutely agree that we hold the politicians to the highest standards in the land, and I think that we should, and the workplace should be one of the exemplar workplaces in Australia. I mean, I sit on other boards 
across Australia and it is not an exemplar workplace. Why is it not? Why are we not fixing some of the issues that Zed was talking about then in our legal system whereby only that one in 10 complaints, one in 10 people who go to the police with their allegations of sexual assault actually have any legal recourse at all. And I think when we look back, that there was a, um, an, an inquiry in 2020 in, that the Human Rights Commission put in place, 55 recommendations. Where are those 55 recommendations? What about the Sexual Discrimination Act that excludes parliamentarians and judges from sexual harassment when they're actually acting in the course of their work? Are those sorts of things, things that we should be nubbing out on and looking at, rather than actually, you know, having this political... Because when you read about it at the moment in the papers, you can't get any commentary that's not, you know, political. We, don't, we need to get rid of the politics. I think we need to get on to the, to the real issues that Chloe has mm -hmm. talked about and others have talked about, and we need to start actually helping and making change in a space where, at the moment, uh, we really need to make that change. Mm. OK. If this part of the conversation raises any issues for you, you can contact 1800 RESPECT or Lifeline. Their numbers are on your screen right now. Our next question comes from Ian Abbey. With the European Parliament voting overnight to place new tariffs on countries lacking serious pollution reduction programs, it would seem on the surface to be foolish for the agricultural sector to be excluded from any Australian net zero emissions targets. How will the National Farmers Federation convince the government to change its stance? <laughs> oh, me again, Hamish. <laughs> that is you. Uh, look, we have um, agriculture in Australia, I'm really pleased to say, are uh, recognised as global leaders in this space. Um, we have put out there our targets. Some of our commodities are actually way ahead of Let, Let's just be clear, because not everyone watching will know this. The NFF is committed to net zero by 2050. Net zero by 2050 and with a couple of important caveats, OK? So we want to make sure that there is... A, so we've set our target and now we need to, to work on the path to get there. Let's be clear about that, OK? We've set the target and there's a lot of things we need to do to make sure we get there, but we believe we're well on the way. But some within the coalition who represent presumably many of your members in their constituencies want carve-outs for agriculture in any commitments to emissions reductions? Well, at the moment, we are the party that represents farmers. We're not a party. We are the group that represents farmers. And the farmers that belong to the NFF, um, whether you're a grain grower, whether you're, you grow cattle for, for meat, whether you grow chickens, whether you grow pigs, whether you grow pulses for people's burgers and things like that, uh, they've all supported targets that are net zero by 2050. And we're now so really... So why are the politicians running around saying farmers want exemptions? Well, I th I'm not sure. You'll have to ask them, Hamish. But, look, at the moment, farm, you know, farmers really... At climate is something... We've just been talking about drought. Sure. Um, farmers are tied to the hip with climate. We're tied to the hip with carbon. Our farms are just a big old carbon cycle okay, going around and around. I want Zed's we want answer on that, then. Why, if this is the body representing farmers, are there politicians in your government running around saying farmers want exemptions? Well, I can't speak for individuals. I can speak for the government. Um, and the government's position is that we've set strong targets and, in fact, we are meeting and beating uh, those very strong targets and that in doing that... Well, I'll, I'll give an example. And uh, it's, it's always interesting that sometimes when we hear from other countries about what they're doing or not doing... I mean, uh, our, our emissions reductions since 2005 uh, updated just uh, in the last week or two around 19% reduction. If we compare that to many uh, like-minded countries, many similar economies like Canada, uh, which have been basically stable in that time, New Zealand, which have only dropped by 1% in that time. Uh, the OECD average is, is less than half of that. Uh, so if you look at all of those comparable nations, if you look at all of the particular challenges we bring, uh, we are doing a, a lot of heavy, heavy lifting. We have the highest take-up uh, of solar uh, in, in the world in recent times. Can we just come so, back to this so, question, but, though, about farmers and exemptions for, for agriculture? Well, but it needs to be are... said in terms of what we are doing. And in terms of, in terms of those questions, uh, that's not the government's policy. The government's policy is to work on technology, and a lot of that is done uh, with our agricultural sector. Uh, and, and and working with the agricultural sector, but whether it's in the electricity space, uh, whether it's in agriculture, whether it's in other parts of industry, mm -hmm. we'll take a technology focus, not a taxes focus, and we are getting that done. Gareth Parker, does this conversation sound like a riddle to you? A little bit. I mean, <laughs> I'll talk about where I live. Uh, in the southwest of Western Australia, it's an incontrovertible fact that rainfall has been in decline for about 40 years, mm -hmm. and it's a really clear trend. 
and you can have a debate if you want to about whether it's human-induced or some sort of cyclical um, natural phenomenon. Most of the science that I read suggests that human uh, activity is making a contribution and the consequence is less and less rainfall. Now, we are one of the great grain-growing provinces of the world. Uh, the wheat and sheep farmers in the wheat belt, uh, the ones that I talk to, especially the current generation, are environmentalists and they know that it rains less than it used to. And they know that they have to do everything in their power with technology, uh, intelligence, smart technology, the way that they cultivate the seeds that they use, the, the spraying regimes, everything, to try and uh, deal with the absolute, undisputable scientific fact that there's less rain than they used to be. And you know what? They're doing brilliantly at it. We've had record seasons. Uh, despite all of that, uh, they get more and more efficient. So I, I'm a little bit unclear on, on to what exactly the exemptions we're talking about. Like if you're running a, a, a combine harvester across a massive wheat and sheep farm uh, out in the wheat belt of WA, clearly at the moment you're going to use diesel. Uh, and so you contribute to emissions. Um, but Fiona's comment about farming being a giant carbon cycle I think is right. So, so what are we actually talking about here? Is it trying to get farmers off uh, diesel machinery and onto electric machinery. Well, I'm an optimist. I think the technology will probably get us there in the future. But so I'm a little bit in, unclear on exactly what we're talking about. But the farm, farmers that I talk to in this state are environmentalists because they have to be. We, we, we don't want to be carved out. We, we, we absolutely agree. I mean, we think that, is, that, that we're part of the solution. But, you know, one of the reasons that we've met our Kyoto targets, and it looks like we're going to be meeting Paris as well, is because of the, some of the heavy lifting that farmers did. And that was through, you know, shutting down huge swathes of our industry instead of letting us do some of the sustainable land management, implement some of the practices that Gareth's talking about there. And so... But there's a lot of things we need to do. We do need to work with the government with technology. Um, we do need... That is part of the solution. The soil... We are just one big carbon cycle that goes round and round, but it's not as easy to keep the carbon in the soil as you think it might be. It comes out again. So we have to do a lot of work. But I did think, Hamish, that the question was about the EU, just a little bit rich for the EU to talk about protectionism um, and how uh, when they <laughs> are one of the vaccines. most... And also the hang on to the vaccine and they're one of the most subsidised agricultural communities in the whole world. OK, let's take our next question. It comes from Krishan Singh. Over the past year, we've seen the federal government effectively turn their back on universities in Australia, resulting in thousands of job losses and a decrease in the number of international student arrivals and enrolments. Given that higher education is one of our largest service-based exports, how does the federal government plan to help Australian universities out of the growing crisis and ensure we don't fall behind the rest of the world? Christina Keneally, before we go to the government. Well, oh, thank you for acknowledging I'm not answering on behalf of the government. <laughs> Thanks, Hamish. Uh, look, uh, Labor's been clear. Universities should have been included in JobKeeper. They were deliberately excluded by uh, the government when the wage subsidy was introduced. And international students, yes, it's a great loss to the university sector. And it speaks to why we need a national leadership on the quarantine and the federal borders. You know, again, in the Constitution, the Commonwealth has responsibility for our international borders and for quarantine. If you want to bring a horse into Australia, it's going to go into a federal quarantine facility. If you want to bring a person into Australia, suddenly the Commonwealth pretends it's no longer their responsibility. If this government had followed Jane Halton, their hand-picked experts, uh, recommendations to set up a national quarantine facility with surge capacity to get the stranded Australians home, we would be in a circumstance now to be able to use an expanded quarantine to bring in international students, skilled workers like in cybersecurity where we desperately need them because we aren't training enough Australians. You know, that is the frustration I have right now. Uh, that we are playing catch up on what we should have been doing over the last 12 months, which was fixing up a quarantine so we get stranded Australians home and then set a plan for people to be able to cross our border safely and with certainty during a time of COVID. Zed. Um, well, thank you for the question. Um, I don't accept, I guess, uh, the premise that, that we've abandoned universities. Um, I, I think the figures in terms of the level of support this year um, is around about the $20 billion figure, which is uh, still at record levels. Um, and yes, the university sector has faced great challenges uh, in the last year or so. There is no doubt about that. Uh, what we have seen uh, is some significant challenges, obviously, with uh, international border closures and international students. Many of those international students have 
uh, remained enrolled and have been uh, working online, which of course uh, means that in some cases, in many cases, uh, a lot of that revenue will still continue and we've underpinned a lot of it through certain guarantees. Uh, but also we know uh, that if they can't come into the country, uh, that has other flow-on impacts uh, for other sectors as well. So uh, there are great challenges that we are grappling with, but we are providing uh, record support. Uh, and as we come through uh, this year, uh, as we come through uh, and it, with a strong economy and a strengthening economy uh, compared to the rest of the world, uh, as we've managed the health crisis, our university sector will be in a good place to rebound and the government will be there uh, to work with them through that process. So we would never abandon the university sector. It is a very important sector and we'll continue to support it. And I think it's to the tune, someone will correct me on that number, but to the tune of around $20 billion this year. Can I say the university sector, I mean, obviously I'm from the university sector, so um, to make that obviously transparent, but the university sector also provides another framework for thinking about the disproportionate effect of um, COVID on women and women's workforce participation. Mm -hmm. You know, the numbers um, and proportion of women in higher education is greater and so the um, job loss is greater. And so the question is, why wasn't um, JobKeeper directed to, to be able to, you know, transparently ensure that, um, you know, the diversity of the community is, is being um, supported here? And I think um, just looking forward in all of these economic um, um, packages, rescue approaches, we need more transparency from the government as to who is actually be benefited, is being benefited and how can we make sure that men and women equally are being encouraged to stay part of the workforce? Or, and interestingly, the first group of workers who lost JobKeeper were the childcare workers. You know, after that really powerful period of universal childcare which enabled and recognised that childcare and early childhood education is a, an essential service for us as a society, that vanished and, and the childcare workers were the first to leave to lose JobKeeper. We have to ask serious questions and towards um, the next budget, how much is being disaggregated as to who, is, who are the winners and who are the losers? But just on, just on the JobKeeper... Um, you could make it quick, just quickly on the JobKeeper, uh, universities were not excluded from JobKeeper. They didn't get the same concessional treatment that uh, the charitable sector more broadly got, uh, but they were given the same opportunity if the turnover test was met, uh, just as large businesses would have. OK, let's take our next question. It's from Anna Laverty on this topic. The Australian music industry has suffered immeasurably over the last year. To many, it may seem that we're back to pre-COVID business, but the reality is 90% of businesses in my industry are still reliant on JobKeeper. We want to get back to work, but border restrictions, regulations and venue capacities have either forced us to continually reschedule or cancel shows. In light of the most recent announcement for further industry relief promised to the tourism sector, what further relief can we in the music and arts industries expect to receive before we lose the businesses and skills of our industry? Gareth Parker, do you think some industries like arts have missed out? Well, I certainly feel for the music industry, they have been obliterated. And again, like this is the uneven nature of this, is because whenever you rely on an industry that sees people moving across jurisdictions, they're the ones that have been most affected. Um, and, you know, on my radio show in Perth, we talked to uh, the bass player for a band that many of your uh, viewers tonight would remember, <laughs> Jebediah, um, talking about the reality of, of what the last 12 months have been like. Yeah. So I think there is that they are another industry who do need a sort of a similar package to what's been announced by the government today. Mm. I don't think ongoing job subsidy forever is it. And we're not just talking about the people who play musical instruments either. We're talking about the lighting people, the sound people, the caterers, all of those, um, the transport workers, you know, who put these massive, massive tours on. And they work from tour to tour to tour. And those tours are just gone. Will so there I think be a package there's definitely for, a case for music for and arts? Well, I, I can't announce that on behalf of the, <laughs> the arts minister tonight. So obviously, I'll, I'll let him uh, speak to that. There has been significant support for the sector, uh, including uh, through things like JobKeeper, but in terms of other targeted support as well. And yes, uh, it's a sector that's absolutely been doing it very tough. But I, I can't give you an answer on that on, on what may uh, be there in the future. I'll leave that to the relevant minister. Hamish, my understanding is that about a th roughly a quarter or a third people in the arts and entertainment industry were never eligible for JobKeeper because of the nature of their work. Yet today we had the greatest of ironies that the venue where Paul Fletcher, the arts minister, went to announce his live music um, subsidy package last August, that venue closed today. 
And they said they closed because they were running out of uh, the capacity to stay afloat without JobKeeper, and that was the, the harsh reality. So we, we have to be upfront and say, this is a sector where we not just risk job losses, but we also risk our own cultural identity if we don't support it. And when we talk about tourism coming back, one of the things tourism comes to is to see live shows in Australia. Mm -hmm. And so this has got to be part of a holistic approach uh, to supporting arts, entertainment and tourism. Can I just add there A very also, brief final thought. Well, the holistic approach has to recognise that we're all citizens and active citizenship means that you have to have an, a basic economic base. We didn't get to talk about job seeker, but mm. you need a minimum wage to be able to be real citizens politically and, and uh, involved in society. And whether it's job keeper or job seeker, we as a society need to look after everybody to ensure that we're all participants in what mm. we do. That is all we've got time for tonight. Uh, would you please keep the applause going for Fiona Simpson, Christina Keneally, Zed Seselja, Kim Rubenstein and Gareth Parker. Thank you. Before we leave you tonight, uh, a brief postscript from Anna Walker, who you may remember from our program last week. Hi, I'm Anna. I was sexually assaulted when I was at university and I told my story to Q&A last week and had a really wonderful answer from the panel on Thursday night. I just wanted to thank them and also thank Brittany Higgins. I can't believe this is now a national conversation and I think we're coming a long way really quickly. So thank you so much for everything that you've already done. I've had an awful few weeks thinking and talking about this, and I can't imagine what this has been like for you, but thank you so much. And thank you also to you, Anna, as well. And that brings us to next week's program, the C word that everybody in this country is talking about right now, consent. This is a big conversation at the moment. Uh, we'd like to, you to help shape it on this program. We'll bring together students, parents, schools, experts, whoever you want. Please do get in touch if you want to get involved in that program. It'll be one of the most important conversations we have. Very good night. Thank you.